I'm Amber Corrin with C4ISRNet. We're here at AUSA 2016 talking cyber defense with some of the Army's top officials in cyber. Today I have with me Mr. Ron Pontius from Army Cyber Command. We have Mr. Henry Muller from CERDEC. And we have Mr. Manish Patel from PEO EIS. Thank you gentlemen for joining us. Appreciate it. So cyber has been a big theme here at AUSA. Um, and, it's, and it's a big overarching theme. In fact, uh, Secretary Carter has declared that DOD networks um, are a top priority. So, uh, Mr. Pontius, maybe you can tell me a little bit about what the Army is doing in that regard. So the Army is, is in great need of modernizing our, our networks, our data, and our systems. And we're aggressively working this in partnership uh, with DISA and the Air Force, particularly uh, the Joint Regional Security Stacks and, and increasing, the, increasing the bandwidth and networks uh, in partnership with uh, POEIS, really working this. Um, the, the, the need is we really, the Army's the last to collapse and converge our networks. And so part of the, in addition to modernization, is working that convergence. Um, that is really important, not only for us to have a better operational platform, but then to be able to defend it. Excellent, okay. Um, so I know that there's a lot of investments going on across the Army. Mr. Muller, um, you are dealing with R&D. Can you tell me a little bit about some of the investments that you're doing in, in terms of cyber defense? Sure, one of the largest um, challenges that we have in CERDEC is we're focused mostly on the tactical network, where down as you get closer to the tactical edge, you're limited in processing and bandwidth, mm -hmm. and at times you're disconnected and then you're connected again. Uh, a lot of the tools that are invested in today for our operational and strategic networks uh, take a lot of processing horsepower and a lot of bandwidth, and they have to call home and they're commercially based. The tactical network, we're developing uh, cyber defense tools that uh, only require lightweight processing and limited bandwidth, uh, low, slow data rate transfer in order to create the situational awareness necessary uh, to allow our, our uh, soldiers to defend the network and operate the network. Absolutely, that's great. Um, let's see, Mr. Patel, you know, you're working the enterprise information system side of this, so it's yet another side of the coin. Uh, maybe you can tell me about what you're doing in terms of uh, cyber acquisition at EIS. Sure, so um, as Mr. Pania said, uh, the need is great and, and it's urgent. Um, and so one of the things that we're doing right now in, in concert with Army Cyber, they published a, a set of operational need statements mm -hmm. recently. Uh, we've taken uh, a subset of those that deal with the defensive cyber operations requirements uh, and been assigned the, the lead responsibility within the, the uh, acquisition community. Uh, and what we're doing to, to get after uh, those capabilities is, is two parallel paths. One is looking at it from an enduring perspective. So doing the, the, the steps that are necessary to establish programs of record. Uh, so we, we look at the cyber acquisition needs uh, from a long-term perspective uh, and set the, the wheels in motion, both from a capabilities documents perspective, which has been generated uh, for those requirements, as well as a design document, which is in the process. All those are pointed towards uh, contracts that we want to put in place if, if, if the, the alignment occurs as we anticipate uh, early in FY18. So that's the enduring piece. The, the longer, or the, I'm sorry, the interim uh, aspect mm -hmm. of this is to address the urgency. And what we're doing there, again, in, in conjunction with our partners at R-Cyber, as well as Netcom, uh, from an operations standpoint, is to look at um, pilot programs uh, to bring these capabilities uh, to the field sooner. Uh, and what we're doing in those areas is looking at uh, the infrastructure, to basically create the maneuver space for cyber protection teams and other cyber warriors to do their cyber business, if you will, um, as well as uh, giving them the tools that are necessary, again, to, to fight that cyber fight. Uh, and lastly, uh, looking at it from an analytics perspective, right? the, the data analytics, uh, specifically looking at from a cyber defense perspective, uh, what type of capabilities are necessary so we can uh, detect and illuminate adversaries that, that may be trying to penetrate our networks, maybe already in our networks, as well mm -hmm. as kind of aberrant behavior, I'll call it, things that are out of the ordinary so we can respond uh, as needed. Absolutely. And I think both of you mentioned the, the tactical side of things, so I think you can probably both speak to this, or maybe even all three of you. But what's being done to 
to secure the systems that are being fielded out there today, the radios, the, the various types of equipment that they're using, that are using the network. And how are you ensuring that soldiers are getting, are getting secure information that they can trust? So uh, we're working uh, with our PEOs, uh, developing programs in our science and technology investment portfolio, uh, and the CIO G6 and people like NSA, agencies such as NSA, uh, to, like I said, to develop those lightweight sensors that we can embed in current systems that will detect anomalous behavior. Uh, most of the systems today are signature based. We need to get to anomaly based systems and we also need uh, our, our developing capabilities that allow our systems to somewhat act on their own over time before human intervention is in the, uh, it can be possible. So, so we're, we're investing in tools and we're investing in those tools to embed in our current systems as we go forward as well how do we improve our approach to overall cyber situational awareness going forward so we have a a large investment in a science and technology uh, effort that gets after cyber situational awareness as was alluded to uh, a moment ago. And what are the analysis tools to get after that to give our soldiers and that's what they need to uh, fight through cyber. Uh, and that means fighting knowing that, that we are being attacked by our enemies, they are on our networks. How do we reconfigure our networks? How do we uh, morph our networks in order to allow them to fight through those through those cyber attacks. And we're working at Army Cyber Command in concert with our Training and Doctrine Command and our Forces Command. We're running a series of pilots or experiments at our combat training centers. Uh, we did two at the Joint Readiness Training Center in Fort Polk in FY fiscal year 15, and we did two at the National Training Center in 16. And it really is how do we integrate uh, signal, cyber, electronic warfare, and information operations at the brigade combat team level. Really looking at what the capabilities that are existing at the brigade combat team, how do we help the S6, the signal officer and his, his or her team in the brigade combat team, how do they really operate and defend their own capabilities, but then how do we bring in further specific cyber capabilities, defensive, offensive, and how do we really integrate cyberspace capabilities into unified land operations. So the Army is doing this series of experiments that will, will over time help inform the full, you know, force structure, doctrine, training, organization. Um, we have two more experiments to run in fiscal year 17, and then that'll be informing the way ahead. But part of this is how do we operate and defend our own systems, because that's critically important. Absolutely. And, and, we're, and, conduct, then... and we're conducting experiments at the engineering level with the uh, current cyber protection teams as well as operational units uh, to get after how they want to fight going into the future given some of the future some of the future concepts such, such as uh, SEMA, the SEMA conference uh, concept that the Army is coming up with and what are the S&T investments that are necessary working with the soldiers to understand how they want to fight in the future in order to make those investments. And you, the other uh, exercise is the Cyber Blitz. Cyber we did Blitz, last spring mm -hmm. up yeah. at uh, Joint Base uh, an Dix McGuire, yeah. and then the Cyber Quest down at Fort Gordon this summer was getting at this communication electronics um, activity. How do you really integrate those activities, converge the capabilities in the Tactical Operations Center? So it's a great partnership that's going on across many parts of the Army. CERDEC, CECOM, the PEOs, the Cyber Center of Excellence, the Operational Force, and it really is a great partnership. Um, the recognizing technology is changing, the threat is changing, and how do we really get at this to really know uh, that we can trust our system, the system's gonna be there, how do we operate through that, how do we have the capability? Absolutely. Um, any thoughts, Mr. Patel? Sure, from um, the... so as you said at the outset, um, POES has the enterprise systems, uh, information systems in the Army, uh, in many ways that help the, the Army run, if you will, uh, ranging from the Financial transactions uh, with the with GFIBs, uh, logistical uh, information with our uh, LMP and G Army programs, as well as personnel and pay with IPSA. Um, they are uh, logical targets, if you will. Uh, Absolutely. Because of the wealth of information, uh, transactional information in those systems. Uh, so, one of the things that we're doing uh, is, is essentially applying a, we'll call it a continuous monitoring uh, process uh, within the PEO mm -hmm. where our IA professionals weekly basis go to our authorizing official uh, to review the IA status. Uh, so albeit manual, um, one of the things that we're in search of is something that will help us do that uh, in a more automated, um, real-time fashion to, to give that visibility to, to leaders um, 
in, in the form of a dashboard. Uh, but applying that rigor uh, on an ongoing basis uh, to, to ensure that we are doing everything that's necessary when it comes to the necessary scans and respond, responding to scan results, uh, as well as tracking um, you know, plans of action and milestones to close out findings that, that may be there within our systems from a, from a vulnerability perspective. So keeping that, uh, keeping that flat, so that spotlight on our systems on an ongoing basis right. is, a, is a key part uh, within our PEO and as I, I imagine throughout the ESOL community. Uh, the other thing that we're doing because of the software intensive nature of many of our systems uh, and the increasing target that software is uh, amongst the, the cyber uh, community We've instituted uh, a program for a few years now to, to uh, review the software code that's being developed uh, throughout the PEO. Uh, and that includes looking at it from a code quality perspective as well as from a code vulnerability perspective. Uh, the idea there being, let's find those, those issues early and often and remediate, remediate them as quickly and as early in the process as possible. Uh, one, it saves cost, and two, it, it produces better quality, more secure software. Absolutely, that's great. Um, did you have something that you wanted to add to that? Okay, uh, I had a I had a question. We started you started talking about the electronic warfare uh, EW side of things. I have lots of questions about that. It's been a huge topic of discussion here at AUSA. Um, how do you see it? I know convergence is kind of sometimes seen as like a, a maybe not the best way to describe it, but how do you see it from your perspective? So it's really. Uh, and some people uh, take convergence as being almost subsuming, right. uh, and that's not the convergence should be talked about. <clears throat> it really is about how do you integrate the capabilities to achieve an operational effect in support of the commander, the maneuver force of what they're doing. That's what convergence is about. It's about integration and capability, integration of, of data to enable faster decision making and execution. And so that's what the discussion is about convergence. Um, the Army is working, we have an Army cyber strategy in the Army. Um, that's over Army, not specifically Army Cyber Command. And now the Army is working on developing electronic warfare strategy for the Army to say where the Army should be going with this. And there's clearly a relationship between the DODEN, the Department of Defense Information Network, the Army portion of that, uh, the cyber, electronic warfare, information operations, and again, how is that integrated in the unified land operations? And something you've heard at this conference, again, is the multi-domain multi battle. It's, it's, again, cyber with the physical domains of air, land, sea, and space. How does that all work together? And so that's part of what the whole convergence is, really think integration of capabilities. <clears throat> Absolutely. And Mr. Muller, from the R&D side of things, um, how, are you, how are you working to synchronize or how are you researching and developing to synchronize cyber and EW from your perspective? So at CERDEC and, and even in one, of my, in one of my organizations, across two of my organizations, we have the offensive, the defensive cyber, as well as the electronic warfare science and technology efforts, as well as some of the intel stuff. So what we look at today is we see a lot of, most of the underlying enabling technologies that allow us to get after these cross-domain capabilities are converging, they're blurring. So that enables us to get out of what I call the boxology approach to capabilities, where we can converge these capabilities onto a single architecture and they can exist in a single system on multiple platforms, on more platforms, which I believe in the future will allow us to deconflict and better coordinate these effects on the battlefield along with our communications and give the commander a better uh, field of choices when making the decision as to whether about what kind of an effect that they need to deliver uh, in order to accomplish their mission. So, a lot of investment there. It sounds like it. And how do you, and Mr. Patel, maybe this is a question for you, how do you approach the acquisition piece of that that supports the not just the cyber and EW, but cyber defense altogether? So um, f from the acquisition perspective, uh, I would say one of the challenges we, that we face, I mentioned the tools that we're looking at uh, in, in response to the, the need statements that are there. Um, one of the things that we're trying to resist is the uh, tendency to, to get a plethora of tools. Right? Uh, what we want to try to focus in on is, is getting the right tool uh, for, for the right purpose uh, and providing it to the put it in the right hands. Uh, so, so 
focusing on what's the right tool. And one of the things that we're trying to do, uh, since this is relatively new within our portfolio, is become more educated consumers. Right? So being able to come to a, uh, a trade show, uh, going through the exhibits here, yeah, it's, it's useful to, to get that information, uh, but it's also important to resist the temptation to, to look at something and say, yeah, I want that, give me two of those, um, when, it, when you're looking at a particular tool. Uh, because from an acquisition standpoint, we don't have the luxury of doing that. Right. Uh, um, but we do have, uh, I guess, a, a duty to, to make sure, again, like I said, we're educated consumers and we take the requirements that are provided to us and distill them into specifications that get the right tool uh, to support the mission. So I'd like to add to that a piece sure. about, it really is about speed. So when you think about the Doden piece, it really is about how we, we need, there need to be more deliberate in thinking through the architecture and how we're going to evolve forward, but then it is a matter of the pace of which we implement. And I, I, I use the Joint Regional Security Stack as an example. Historically, we would have done that all out of POEIS with a lot of contractors. And what we've done in the last two years would have probably previously taken us eight or 10 years to get there. Sure. And so there's there's really is the technology, uh, if we're not careful, we're fielding you know, last generation technology now and in the near future. So we have, to, we have to figure out the implementation on the Doden faster. On the equipping the cyber mission force, uh, which Manish talked about earlier, that's really defensive cyber and offensive cyber. Speed is a critical element. And much of that is, because we're not doing the whole army, so to speak, it really is about how do we prototype, how do we get capability in the hands of our very highly highly technical and very competent cyber soldiers and civilians um, prototyping in speed, and that is very important. Pace of change of technology, pace of change of the adversary, speed is a critical element. That's the conversation we're having in the Army. We're, we haven't cracked it yet, but we're continuing to push. How do we, it's not just about capability, but how quickly can we do it? So if I may, I'll dovetail off of that in, in terms of the, the acquisition challenge. Uh, in addition to the speed, flexibility, um, uh, to, and, and the responsiveness that, that we need to have in terms of contracting instruments so we can address the, the need for speed. And you can see Secretary Fanning, uh, Secretary of the Army, wrote, has recently rolled out the Rapid Capabilities Office. And, and some of the areas he's focused on is position, navigation, and timing, electronic warfare, and cyber. Those are three of the focus areas, recognizing the pace of change of technology, and, and the Army has to move faster in this space to be relevant. And in the S&T realm, we're right. making investments in trying to define those future architectures based on the standards and the convergence of those technologies that I talked about later, that puts in place the platforms that allows us to get to a capability-based approach as opposed to a system-based approach. So we focus our time and our energy on rapidly developing capabilities that can be very rapidly hosted on an existing architecture going forward so we have that speed and agility that we need to keep up with the threat. Absolutely. And then maybe for a final question, Mr. Pontius, maybe you referenced the, the forces, the cyber mission teams and the cyber mission forces. Maybe you can give us an update on the progress that the Army is making and building and equipping your forces. The Army's doing very, very well here. Um, the, the direction from the Secretary of Defense back in 2012 was to build the cyber mission force across the four services and to be at initial operational capability by the end of fiscal year 16. The Army's portion of that, the total force, uh, the Army's portion was 41 teams. We met uh, our, made the IOC of 41 teams, and in fact, 28 of those teams are now at full operational capability. We're well on our way to meeting. That requirement is by the end of fiscal year 18. We'll be mostly there by, by the end of 17. Um, and what's really important is quickly as we've built those teams over this four years, they've been put on mission. There's such a need. And that's, that's part of what, what Ms. Patel talked about earlier, particularly the equipping of our cyber protection teams. Uh, we have very highly trained individuals, so now it's a matter of getting the tools, working through how to do operations, the tactic techniques and procedures. Uh, the Army's doing very well. And the other thing to highlight, which is also why the Army's doing well, we stood up a new military, operation, military career field uh, over the last year, and that's the new Cyberspace Operations Career Field 17. And we're the only service that has a dedicated military cyber career field. And, and that is really paying huge dividends in the near term and will, to over, will over time, because now we have folks that are absolutely dedicated working this full time. 
and, and that's very important. The Army's doing very well in building the teams, building up and working on operations. Then to follow up on that, have you seen an improvement in network defenses as you've been so successful in building up your Army cyber teams? Um, yes, and the, the cyber mission force isn't <clears throat> doing the normal operate and defend, right. but we are working hand in hand because uh, uh, much of the strategic part of the Army Signal Corps actually is under this, uh, Lieutenant General Cardone as mm -hmm. the commander of Army Cyber Command and Second Army. And so uh, part of what we are doing, working hand in hand with the Signal Corps on the, that really does the Doden, how do we raise the level? And we're seeing much better results on that at our combat training centers. The ability to really operate and defend the networks is, we're raising that, uh, but, we, but we need to uh, continue to really put a lot of emphasis on it because the threat is evolving at a very fast pace. Absolutely. Well, that was a lot of really great information. Thank you all so much for joining us today. I very much appreciate it. For more coverage of AUSA and of cyber, please visit our website at c4isrnet.com.